Welcome everyone to the 2023 PI conference. We will get started in just a moment. Spanish interpretation is available for this session. You can access the Spanish language line by clicking the world icon on your Zoom toolbar. My name is Colleen Brock, and I will be your moderator for today's session on hematopoietic stem cell bone marrow transplantation. I am very excited to welcome Dr. Lachi Davila, and he will be presenting this topic. There'll be time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please submit any questions you have to the presenter in the Q&A section of the platform. Please note that our guest, labeled as technician, is here to assist in recording today's session. If you have any IT questions as an attendee, please visit the help desk in your attendee hub. Dr. Blachi Davila is an associate professor at George Washington University and attending in the Division of Bone Marrow Transplantation at Children's Hospital in Washington, DC. He received his medical degrees from the University of Puerto Rico and completed residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics at Rush University in Chicago. Following his residency, he completed pediatric hematology oncology fellowship at Oregon Health and Science University, followed by a year of clinical immunodeficiency at Cincinnati Hospital Children's Center. His research interests are in primary immunodeficiencies and reduced intensity transplantation. Currently, he leads the immunometabolic transplant program of the division as well as the Combined Immunodeficiency Transplant Clinic. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Davila. We are so excited to have you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind introduction. You are quite welcome. And with that, you can take over and share your screen. Let's do that. Excellent. Um, so hopefully everybody is seeing my slides okay. Um, yes. As discussed, I am here to give you an overview of stem cell transplant, uh, what it entails, and what are some of the biggest uh, issues that we face during transplant so that you are a little bit more informed about this. Um, these are my disclosures that have nothing to do with the talk we're doing today. Um, so when we are talking about a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, this is essentially what we are discussing. This is um, a process by which we restore bone marrow function. So the Bone marrow um, in patients can be defective for many, many reasons. In most cases of primary immunodeficiency, this is because of a congenital issue. And so we can do a transplant in which we are going to provide healthy stem cells. And as you can see in the diagram to your right here, the stem cell is a cell that has the ability to become all of these cells. So the blood stem cell is going to give rise to all of the cells that we call lymphocytes, which are the B lymphocytes, the T lymphocytes or T cells and the NK cells. Um, but then it also gives rise to all of the other white cells as well as to the red blood cells and to the platelets. So all of these cells are made in the marrow. And in essence, if I'm giving you a bone marrow transplant, I am changing all of these cells to now be made from a stem cell that came from the donor rather than a cell that came from the patient. Um, and so that means that technically any process that involves any of these cells that you see here in the bottom, and if these cells aren't working okay, we could theoretically fix that issue with a bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant. Um, it is quite an intense process. Um, 
And so the slide that you see here is sort of a very brief summary of how Transland comes to be. Um, we'll talk about them more in detail, but first we need to find a good donor for the patient. And that once we have that, we have to prepare the patient in order to receive the new cells or the stem cell transplant. Um, then we have a nice recovery period. And ultimately, after that, we continue to monitor the patient to make sure that everything is going well post-transplant. So let's delve into each of these things a little bit more in detail. Um, the first step is going to be finding a donor. Um, so when we are looking for the donor, we will always look at siblings and at the family first. That is because of course the family and particular siblings share the same DNA makeup than the patient does. And so if we have a good match for the patient within the family, that is always um, our first stop. Um, that is of course, assuming that whoever in the family is a match does not have whatever condition we are seeing the patient for. If there are no good matches within the family, then there are actually many registries that exist. And so these registries um, have access to many, many people that have volunteered to be donors for patients that um, need it. Um, and so the American uh, company that does this is NMDP, and that stands for the National Mayor Donor Program. Um, this is the best way to look for uh, for patients in the registry. And it is also the best way to have anybody that is interested in being a donor be a part of the process. Um, so this is their website. It's called bethematch.org. And I put that in there because um, it is very common once you start discussing transplant that many uh, of your family members or many friends might want to be interested in seeing if they are a possible donor. Um, so if they go to this website, they can actually register um, and they will be sent a kit to them in which we can actually get their DNA and sort of bring them into the registry. Um, I should also add that this is a shared registry, so it's not only within the United States, but there are many other countries in the world that have similar registries and these can be shared. So if there is a patient that has a better match in another country, we are able to work with that country to bring those cells in if needed. Um, and then third, I should also say that there are donated cord registries. So this is not private storing, which is different, but um, there are ways in which um, you can donate cord blood after uh, a delivery, after a pregnancy, and this stored cord blood can also be used as a donor source for transplant. Um, but what exactly are we looking at when we look at a donor? We look at these particular proteins, which are called HLA proteins. Um, and so that stands for human leukocyte antigen. Um, but it's different proteins that are present in every, uh, in every cell of the body. We can do this via a blood test or we can do this via a cheek swab. Um, and so that registry that I mentioned through be the match, that's actually through a cheek swab that you just sent through the mail. Um, and these proteins are important because they are the main method that the cells have to talk to each other. And so this is how your body uh, immune system looks at other cells in the body and asks, is this something that is a part of me and should be here versus if this is something that's not a part of me and should be eliminated. Um, and so that's why it's important to make sure that we try to find a donor whose cells look very much alike the patients. Now, once we have a donor, we are going to do very extensive testing on that donor to make sure that they are healthy enough to donate, but also to make sure that there's nothing that they have that might be passed on to our patient. Similarly, 
we are going to be doing a thorough workup on the patient to make sure we're not going in without knowing everything that the patient has. We wanna know how all their organs work. We wanna know if they have any active infections. We want to know what is the best way to treat them essentially. And so we can tailor our treatment depending on what our workup shows. Um, that workup is typically done as an outpatient, but everything from now on is typically a hospital admission. And this slide is a very, very simple summary of how um, we can think of the bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant. Um, so the transplant is typically going to be on day zero and then Anything that happens on the admission before the actual infusion of the transplanted cells, we called uh, a prep because we're prepping the patient um, to be ready to receive these new cells. Um, and those are typically called minus days. And then after the patient receives the stem cell transplant, we are following those new counts, are waiting for the patient to recover from everything. Um, and so this are typically the plus days of transplant. So if you ever hear us talk about minus days and plus days, that's what we mean. So it is days that are dependent on when the actual stem cell transplant happened. So let's talk a little bit about that first part, the prep part. Um, so like we mentioned, we are sort of prepping the patient to receive these new cells. And so what we're doing here is giving them what we call the preparatory regimen and uh, conditioning is another word for this. Um, typically this is done by medications and by chemotherapy. Chemotherapy does not necessarily mean that the patient has cancer. Um, rather chemotherapy is a word we use to denote any medication that kills cells. Um, and in this particular instance, we are trying to get rid of the old marrow, the old broad products, um, so that we can make space for the new cells to come in. Um, now, radiation is not as common in primary immunodeficiency patients, but it can be used as a part of the preparative regimen in certain disorders. Um, so that's one of the main goals of the preparative regimen, but the second important role is that it gets rid of the body's immune system, because like I told you before, the immune system tells you what's a part of you and should be there versus what's not a part of you and should be removed. So um, if the immune system is working properly, um, those cells are going to reject the new transplant. And so our medications help prevent that rejection from happening. Importantly, though, there are certain scenarios where the immune system is not strong enough to um, be able to do this, um, and the, particularly in some cases of severe combined immunodeficiency. And I mentioned that because this prep may not be needed in all cases. So uh, particularly for some subtypes of skid, this is something that you can consider discussing with your doctor. Um, and then once we prepare the body, we are ready for the transplant, which again is the day zero. Um, as we mentioned before, when we're looking for donors, really we are looking for the best possibly matched donor of this patient. It can be a family member. And if we don't have a family member, it can be an unrelated volunteer. Historically speaking, um, the vast majority of our cells came from to going into a donor's bone marrow. And so that's why we historically call this a bone marrow transplant. However, um, we have many different um, ways of getting those marrow cells, uh, of getting those stem cells, I'm sorry. Um, so there is bone marrow, but like I mentioned, we can use some frozen cord blood and we can also find ways of getting the stem cells peripherally rather than going to somebody's marrow. That is why we tend to use now as a correct term, stem cell transplant rather than bone marrow transplant, just to the note that it can come from any of these sources. Um, 
for the patient itself, the cells come in a little bag and it's kind of infused similarly to what a blood transfusion would be. So we do not have to go into the patient's bone marrow to do this. And uh, both the preparative regimen and the transplant, and then that recovery period, they all happen inside the hospital. Um, so it is important to know that this is quite a prolonged hospital admission, depending on um, the prep regimen and also on the recovery. It can be anywhere from four to eight weeks. Also, um, we will typically limit the freedom that the patient may have during this admission. Um, they are typically going to be in a transplant unit, which is a closed unit, and the rooms themselves are also closed units, and we typically will ask the patient to remain in the room once the prep regimen starts. That's because both the unit and the rooms have a protective environment. They have special air filters and they have special ways of trying to prevent anything from the outside to get in so that we can minimize the risk of patients having an infection through all of this. Um, I should also know that the vast majority of patients are going to get um, a central line placed as they get admitted. That is because um, we can be sure to give all of the chemotherapy medications directly through the IB when we have a central line. Also, we are going to be monitoring uh, blood counts very, very frequently for a long, long time. And so having a central line prevents us from having to poke the patients multiple times. Uh, we can just draw the blood from the line itself. Um, and that is because the patient will typically stay with us through count nadir and through recovery. Um, you know, we will give the chemotherapy. And as you may expect, that preparative regimen is going to get rid of the patient's cells. And then we are going to infuse the new cells. But it will typically take some time from when we infuse the cells to when we can actually detect them. That can vary a lot, but on average, it's about two weeks or so. And so that means that there will come a time where the patient cells are going to be gone, but the new cells haven't quite kicked in. And so that is a time where we have count nadir, essentially the counts are nothing. So during that time, patients require transfusions. And uh, uh, that's the main reason for the protective environment, because during this time, they are at very high risk for infections. And so we very aggressively evaluate for any possible infection, should there be any signs that this may be happening. And uh, this recovery part also takes, way, uh, takes place in the hospital. And uh, again, really what we want to make sure happens is that the new bone marrow cells kick in and start making new blood. Um, the first cells that are going to pop up post-transplants are monocytes and neutrophils, which are a type of white blood cell. Um, and uh, that's why you will hear that when you're in the transplant period, we're going to take uh, we're going to look every day to see what the neutrophil count is doing. Um, oops, sorry. Um, the absolute neutrophil count, or ANC, is uh, a marker of how at risk patients can be of infection. Typically, um, once the counts come back and stay at a sustained level of over 500, we say that those new cells have have taken or that the new transplant has engrafted. That's what engrafted means. So neutrophil engraftment means that we have permanent neutrophil counts back after the counts have been zero. Uh, slowly but surely that marrow is gonna get stronger. And so the patients are gonna need less and less transfusions until they're gonna have normal function and will not need transfusion anymore. Um, the other testing we do to make sure that our transplant work is a test called chimerism. And this is a DNA test that will look at the donor DNA versus the patient DNA. And so we can tell which cells have which DNA and therefore we can say post-transplant which cells are coming from whom. Um, and of course, if the transplant work, our goal is to see that 
most or a good amount of the cells coming out are from the donor. Um, now, like I mentioned, the neutrophil is the first one, but for the full immune system to recover fully, um, this can take a lot of time. Esto puede tomar mucho tiempo. So anywhere um, from six months to two years. Desde un año. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, and so during this time, the patients are going to remain este tiempo, on prophylaxis for infections. Eh, Um, and so there are many, many different infections that we can prevent. So fungus, viruses, um, so that this means several different medications that the patients are typically on until their immune system is fully back to normal. The other big thing that we worry about post-transplant is graft versus host disease. You may have heard of this name. Um, so like I was mentioning to you before, the main job of the immune system is to tell what's you versus what's not you. So in graft versus host disease, these new cells recognize that the patient is different than them and they attack the patient. Um, so it's essentially the new immune system attacking the patient because it's recognizing it as different. Um, there are common organs that where this typically of course the most common ones are skin liver and gut um, the risk of that versus host disease is affected by many many things but the most important one is our donor matching so um, if we can match the donor and the cells uh, in a good way we can greatly minimize this risk um, the other important Thing to notice is inflammation. So uh, if we are going into transplant with certain organs that are very inflamed, those organs are, you know, are essentially going to call these cells to come in. And so they are at greater risk of graft versus host disease happening post-transplant. We can prevent it in several different ways. Um, the most common way is to give patients immunosuppression. And so these are medications that the patients take post-transplant that prevent the new cells from working at 100%. And so that way we can be sure that the new cells coming in um, are growing, but not growing at 100%. And they sort of learn to tolerate the patient and to not attack um, the patient anymore. Um, and once we know that these cells have learned to tolerate the patient, we can actually take the immunosuppression off. So we typically give this for anywhere from three to six months post-transplant. And if everything goes well, we are able to remove it. So this is not a medication that the patients would need to stay on long-term for. Um, another way to do it is that we can actually manipulate the product. So the Immune cells, or T cells in particular, are the ones that create this graft versus host disease. So, particularly in cases where we have issues, you know, we don't have a perfect matching between the donor and the patient, we can remove in the lab the cells that cause the immune attack, and therefore we can fully prevent the GBHD from happening. Now, of course, the T cells not only cause GBHD, but they are very important to prevent infection. So the drawback to that is that the recovery of your T cells gets, it's a little bit longer compared to a transplant where you're giving the full T cells. But that allows us to give transplants to patients that may not have a full donor, a fully matched donor. So in short, this is how I would abbreviate things, right? You have the patient and here's a depiction of the marrow, which is full. The marrow is making red blood cells and is also making white cells, which like I've hinted at are sort of the police that say what in your body should be there versus what shouldn't be there. We give the patient uh, the preparative regimen and that will empty out the marrow. So it'll remove the patient's police cells so that prevents the rejection from happening. And then it also removes the patient's red blood cells and platelets. So it opens up space in the marrow for the new cells to come in. And then we give the actual transplant. 
And that transplant is going to go into the marrow and repopulate the marrow. And then what's going to come out is now new blood and new immune cells that are coming from the donor and therefore don't have the same issue that the patient had. Now, it is important to know that this isn't something that works for absolutely everything. So as I've shown you, we're only changing the, uh, the cells that come from the blood. So red cells, platelets, and white cells. This means that transplant can be helpful for essentially any issue that is specific to a cell within the hematopoietic compartment. Um, and so this is very common in many disorders in which there's a cell that comes from the marrow uh, and doesn't work normally. So patients with severe combined immunodeficiency or patients with chronic granulomatous disease are an example of this. Um, we can also help patients uh, where the problem is a specific protein that may not be unique to the marrow, but it's mostly expressed in the marrow. And so uh, whiskat alger syndrome is a perfect example where, you know, this is a protein that doesn't work well that is really only highly expressed in cells that come from the marrow. And so that's why transplant can fix it. Uh, importantly, if you have a uh, immune defect or immune problem that is not specific to the marrow, uh, we don't typically, we're not able to fully fix that problem. So for example, um, complement deficiency is a type of immune deficiency, but the complement proteins are made in the liver. They're not made in the marrow. So a bone marrow transplant wouldn't fix this problem. Similarly, um, even though it's a T cell problem, um, there are thymic defects, the most important one being 22Q11 syndrome, um, that cause the T cells to not work okay. And so it's very important to know the main reason why T cells aren't working, because if it's a problem in the marrow, a bone marrow transplant can fix it. But if the problem is in the thymus, the bone marrow transplant is not going to be the solution to those problems. Yeah, okay. And so that was kind of a whirlwind, but a nice explanation of what transplant is. And then in the little time we have left, I do want to touch that there are other options other than stem cell transplant that you and your doctors may discuss. Um, so gene therapy is something that is becoming more and more um common and expanding into new diseases. So hopefully we will see a lot more of this in the future. Um, gene therapy is very similar in a way to a bone marrow transplant, except we don't need a different person. We don't need a donor. We actually take the patient's own cells. We fix in the lab whatever gene those isn't working correctly in the cell. And then Similarly, we give a preparative regimen to the patient, but you just give back their own cells. And so, of course, the main benefit of this is that since we're using the patient's own cells, this graft versus host disease uh, thing isn't an issue, and so then immunosuppression isn't needed. Um, so, unfortunately, there are no FDA-approved treatments for gene therapy at the moment for primary immunodeficiencies, although there are many, many, many trials where uh, currently undergoing. So definitely ask your doctor if uh, these are possibilities for some of the disorders that we face out there. Um, I would say the most, the biggest one we've done is for ADA skid, and that was extremely successful and hopefully will be available uh, for many more patients in the near future. Um, enzyme replacement therapy is a treatment that's possible for ADA skid in particular, although I will say we don't typically consider it a long-term solution, but it can buy time if we're thinking about doing a transplant or perhaps waiting for gene therapy, things like that. Um, and uh, you'll notice that for both of these things, I mentioned research trials. Um, so there are a lot of different research trials out there that are not necessarily for gene therapy. They may be for other treatments, or they may actually be to follow the patient and see how the patient does. Really, um, all of these conditions are very, very rare. 
And so the best way of us getting data so that we can actually tell you what works versus what doesn't work for a particular disease is uh, to ask you to be a part of this research trial so we can get more and more patients and therefore know really what works the best for them. So please do consider being a part of one if that is possible for you. And uh, with that, let me close and I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So we now have some time for questions and answers. We have about 15, 20 minutes. And um, before we begin, please put them into the chat and I will go through them. Before we begin, please remember that everyone's treatment and condition are unique. The information presented during this session is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. And with that, we can start taking questions. And before I forget, I want to proudly announce to everybody, because I thought this was very cool and very exciting, that a member of the audience happens to be the oldest ever wasp transplant by 25 and a half years at the time of their transplant five and a half years ago at NIH. So thought that was pretty cool and worth a shout out to them. Indeed. And so let's see as I scroll through. Um, what is the likelihood that the old immune system is taken out via chemo and the new immune system or transplant doesn't take? Ah. Uh -huh. That is a very good question. And so I think, uh, you know, you're getting at to the point of what, what is the risk of rejection in a bone marrow transplant? Um, it's not a simple answer, as you may imagine. It dep does depend on a lot of things. Um, in general, it definitely depends on what we are trying to transplant. Um, you know, like I mentioned to you, the, the immune system, and particularly the T cells, are the biggest culprit of recognizing things as different and attacking them. Um, so if your T cells are not working correctly, uh, say, for example, a patient with severe combined immunodeficiency, um, your risk of rejection becomes much less because your immune system doesn't work. Um, and so I would say for, for defects where your T cells are working very, very poorly, the risk of rejection is actually very, very low. And that's why sometimes we can even go at it without any preparative regimen at all. Um, now for other disorders, that is different. And so when the T cells are working correctly, we do have to use um, the medications in the PrEP regimen to prevent that rejection. Um, and uh, it varies for a lot of different things, but in general, um, the more alike the donor cells and the patient cells are, the better, because the more different they are, the easier the patient might recognize them as different. And also, um, if there's a Así lot... Que como diferentes. No. <laughs> and then also if there's a lot of inflammation sí. in the body um, that well, can that prevent en el cuerpo. We're, we're having technical issues un with un con... the interpretation so hold that thought while well, I try to <sighs> Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. 
Um, I'm trying to mute them and it won't mute. And okay, I'll try again. But yeah, um, essentially, inflammation was the other bit I was mentioning. Um, and it varies a lot depending on the disorder. Some disorders have a higher risk of rejection than others uh, because of the underlying defect. Thank you. Uh, next question. Are post-cyclophosphamide transplants substantial, substantially more common? They're definitely a lot more common than what they used to be. Um, but, um, there are definitely a lot of different ways in which we can do that. Um, so for those of you that have not heard of that before, that means giving that chemotherapy cyclophosphamide after the transplant. And that is a way of destroying the T cells that may cause graft versus host disease. Um, so essentially giving that immunosuppression that we talked about, um, you can do that. You can also remove the cells um, before you give them to the patient, like we talked about. Um, I would say it varies a lot depending on what disorder you are treating, but there are some conditions, particularly if you have an infection that needs T cells, there are some conditions when you really want to keep those T cells and not remove them. And so post-transplant cyclophosphamide gives you a way of doing that, but still minimizing the graft versus host disease. Um, so, you know, I, I would certainly favor it in conditions like that, um, but I would say it's not the only way of doing the transplant, even though it's becoming more and more um, common. Uh, and because it's simple and it's certainly much less cumbersome than try to remove cells in the lab, as you may imagine. Thank you. How old does a WASP patient have to be before being considered for a stem cell transplant? I would say there's no minimum age, honestly. Just um, talk to your doctor. You know, the, the fact that you're meeting your doctor doesn't mean that you have to go to transplant. Um, it can be just to learn how the transplant would look like, or it could be to do the typing. And so the doctor can tell you, you have a ton of matches or you don't have any matches. And I think that information can be helpful when it's time to determine if you want to proceed to transplant or not. Um, in the big cohort of uh, Wiscott patients that have been transplanted, um, Actually, the vast majority of them were transplanted in their first two years of age. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that we have to do it that early. I think um, it's definitely a, a something that you and your doctor can discuss. What is the current best estimate of bone marrow transplant success and how is success defined? One of my nephews was transplanted at one year of age for WAS. Mm -hmm. That is a great question. Um, you know, ideally, for me, a successful transplant would mean that we gave the patient the function that they were missing with little to no side effects by causing that. And so, you know, we want to give that defect, we want to restore that immune function, but we want to do that without causing graft versus host disease or without causing significant organ damage with our chemotherapy and things like that. Um, I will say we've been getting better and better at better at that. Um, most of these immunodeficiencies are, are super rare, as you all know. So it's very hard to give you detailed numbers of. Um, you know, of, of in general, I can tell you, you know, um, severe combined immunodeficiency, Wiscott, and chronic granulomatous disease, those are the three more common, if you want to say it that way, or less rare transplants. And so those are the ones that we know the most about. Um, and, um, you know, since you mentioned Wiscott, I can talk about that. For patients with Wiscott, actually, um, outcomes tend to be 
very, very good. Now, you know, in the, in the 21st century, it's over 90% chance that they're going to survive and have normal function and, um, and uh, resolve any issues that they may have. Now, of course, this is better now than it was in the previous decades, but hopefully we will continue to get better. That's great. Do antibody deficiencies originate in the bone marrow and would a patient potentially be a candidate for a bone marrow transplant? Yes, is the short answer. So um, antibody deficiencies are because your, your B cells are not working correctly or because your T cells aren't working correctly and so they aren't telling your B cells what they need to do. But in essence, the B cells are the ones that make antibody. And so if your B cells are not working correctly, theoretically speaking, yes, we could do a bone marrow transplant and restore B cell function. Now, that being said, um, if the only issue that a patient is facing is um, not making antibody, we can typically provide that with um, with antibody replacement, IBIG or subcutaneous uh, immunoglobulin. And um, that is, it's, it's not perfect. It's not the same thing, but it does tend to restore most of the function um, that the B cells are giving. And so most patients are going to be started on that and not necessarily recommended for transplant. Now, I will say if, if um, we have there are patients in which we have persistent issues despite giving adequate replacement or in which the just the fact that the antibodies are low is not the only problem. They have other issues and um, and we're learning more and more about disorders that we thought antibody was the only issue, but then they have other problems happening. And so those patients are definitely considered for transplant. I saw a previous case study where the child with ALL was infused with HIV, which ended up ridding her of all ALL by hard resetting her cells, basically. Are there any proven hard resets like this that have been shown as far as PID goes? And what are the success rates? Huh. I would have to look into this. That's an interesting question. I'm not entirely mm -hmm. sure which study um, you are referring to. There are many, many studies that have been done at trying to, to reset the immune system, particularly for conditions with very severe autoimmunity. So when the body is attacking itself. Um, and uh, those have not been extremely successful, but I will say that's because we were just doing it for every autoimmunity versus now we have the capacity of actually knowing what are the gene defects and the issues that are causing the autoimmunity. And so I think targeting things di directly is a better way of um, trying to treat these things rather than just doing a full reset. Um, so yeah, at the moment, there's not a lot of those big reset studies happening mm -hmm. because we're, we're getting, I would say, better at trying to get to the root cause of what's causing it. How young can a donor be? So if we're talking about an unrelated donor to be under registry, you have to be an adult. So they are 18 and above. But um, when we're looking at siblings, we... Um, you know, if we have a matched sibling donor, we tend to use very young donors um, without a problem. It's really a question of can they go through the procedure safely? And so, you know, if they're a very tiny baby or somebody with very small weight, we would not want to put them through the through that if it's not safe for them. But in general, um, if they, um, you know, if they're healthy and they're big enough, um, we have used um, even toddlers, so say 16, 17 months. Um, it's definitely doable now that, you know, the other important thing is there is a maximum amount of blood that we can safely take out of a patient. So say if the donor is 16 months, but the patient is a teenager, that is 
we're not going to be able to do that. It would have to be somebody with sort of a similar size, if that makes sense. Have you seen patients with CVID getting transplanted and how are they doing? I have. Um, to be honest, historically, patients with CVID that undergo transplant have not been very successful. Um, but again, that is similar to the autoimmune reset. I think we were just doing things blindly as in like you have CVID, you're all getting this particular scenario. But um, now, uh, now that our genetic testing is so much better, we actually have figured out that there's a lot of things we used to call CVID that actually are caused by monogenic defects. Um, and as we learn what the issue is and we address the issue specifically, um, we are able to treat those things much better. So, you know, rare conditions like CTLA-4 hyperlinsufficiency, LRBA, SAT1, SAT3, those, these are all things that used to be called CVID. Um, and now that we know them and we can control the disease prior to coming to transplant, we are doing much, much better. What is involved for the donor? Must it always access the bone marrow directly? For the donor, um, no, we can do uh, we can do it through the bone marrow. And so that's what we call a bone marrow harvest. Or we can actually also do it through the peripheral blood. Um, and so the way we do that is uh, we actually can give the donor a medication that brings the stem cells out. And then we can collect them through their IV. Excuse me. So. Uh, yeah, both of those ways we can use with the donor. Now, particularly in pediatrics, we prefer to use marrow because when we are taking the blood from the periphery, that those stem cells are going to come with a lot of white cells that are just hovering around the body. And as we've discussed, those are the ones that can cause the graft versus host disease. So taking it from the periphery comes with a bit of a higher risk of that happening. Where can someone get a bone marrow transplant? Does someone with PIDD need to go to a special facility or hospital? I would say yes, to be honest. <laughs> um, there are, I would say the good thing is there are a lot of hospitals now compared to previously that have a lot more experience in PID. So actually the, the IDF here is a great resource. They have, um, uh, they, they have it within their website, a place where you can actually look for patients, uh, sorry, for doctors that specialize in treating patients with PID. Um, and so that way, you can find a good P, the, the nearest PID center near you. Um, you know, in general, these types of transplants are a little bit different than what we have historically done for transplants. And some of the worries that you have coming into the transplant are different. So it is typically better if you have somebody that has some experience in managing the primary immunodeficiencies. Do you have any knowledge about? I see stem, I see I stem, which is now being used as a form of stem cell transplantation as a potential treatment for HIV. I'm sorry, say that again. I stem? I see I stem. It is now being used as a form of stem cell transplant for HIV. Huh. I'm sorry, I don't have much experience in that, you know. Um... We are, you know, I, I, I would say, thankfully, since we're at Children's National in the pediatric age, we really don't see a lot of um, HIV specific um, immune deficiencies. You know, most of the immunodeficiencies I manage are, are sort of primary or genetic based. Um, but I will say our, my colleagues at George Washington, and I know many of my adult colleagues are working on several different ways um, of trying to cure HIV and several of those are stem cell transplant trials. So I do know they exist, but unfortunately, I, I don't have much knowledge on that for you. Well, thank you.
What are the odds of finding a successful match among sibling versus in the registry? Yeah. So um, any, you know, we, the HLA proteins are sort of co-express. So that means you express the ones you get from mom and the ones you get from dad. So every time you have a kid, um, you are going to pass some of yours either the ones you got from mom, the ones you got from dad, and same with that. And so that means if you have a second kid, there's a one in two chance that you're going to give them the same proteins you gave your first child, and same with that. So when you combine that 50% and the 50%, that's a one in four. So there's about a 25% chance that any of that any one sibling is going to be a match to your other sibling. Um, and now, of course, if you have many, many children in the family that greatly increases the probability that you may find a match sib uh, to do the transplant with. If we don't have a match sibling and we go into the registry, then really um, the biggest factor involved in trying to get that is um, ethnicity. So the HLA proteins tend to cluster within ethnic groups very, very, very closely because they're all very close to each other. So there's very little variability. Um, so as an example, if, um, you know, if somebody here in the U.S. is 100% of German ancestry, mm -hmm. very likely they're going to have many, many donors in the German registry. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, um, we also, you know, we're also at the mercy of the programs in the world that exist. And as you may imagine, this is something that typically only exist in first world countries um, that have the ability to pay for all of this system. So that does mean uh, Europe, the US, Canada. Um, so as you may imagine, that means that uh, there's a much heavier Caucasian representation in the registry and that ethnic minorities are at greater risk of not finding good donors, particularly if they're of mixed ancestry, because then we have to find somebody that has a similar ethnic mix. Interesting. Real quick, last question. Legally, are parents allowed to use one child as a donor for their other child against the donor child's wishes? Ooh, um, challenging question. We, yes. um, <laughs> I have never been in that position, to be honest. Um, our, our system is to ask for assent on all the children that are able to assent. So, you know, obviously the, if they're not of age, the, the adults are the ones that consent, but if, if they're old enough to understand the process, we will explain the process to them and we will typically ask for their assent. Um, that sounds like a very tough situation, I, I will say. I, I honestly have never been in that position. I, I don't know that I would force a child to do that because it's not something you know, it's it's not a minor procedure, right. um, but but again, I yeah, that's quite a challenging question. I can definitely see arguments to to each side, so I, I would definitely try my best to to explain to that child why this would be so helpful for their brother or sister. And I would think that that would be something that others will be brought in, and maybe even the medical ethics board for sure have to be involved. Well, I really appreciate you answering all these fantastic questions, and I am grateful for your presentation and for everybody attending. This has been a wonderful session. Thank you so very much, for to, again, to everybody. And this is only one session out of 39 unique learning opportunities that IDF is providing in our 2023 PI conference. So I hope you will come back tomorrow. I hope everybody enjoyed today and you'll come back tomorrow for even more fun and exciting and opportunities to learn more and more about PI and the world we live in. So thank you everybody and have a wonderful afternoon and evening and we will see you later. Bye. Good night, everybody.